So our next speaker is Mimi Ho from Columbia University. And the title of her talk is Visualizing the Translational Choreography of Malaria Parasites. Thank you so much, Martini. And thank you to uh, Peter and Prakash and Audrey so much for putting together this amazing symposium and inviting me to speak here. I'm really excited about this talk because this is the first time I'm going to be presenting new data um, from our lab. So very excited to be here. So, sorry? Is this better? Yes? OK. So I don't think that this audience needs an introduction to malaria, but um, this slide I'm just kind of using to, sh to uh, demonstrate that we're mostly working on kind of the um, asexual blood stages of the parasite. Is the laser pointer not working? OK. So um, in our lab, we use structural biology to kind of understand the um, host pathogen interactions, specifically in the asexual blood stages. And so before I dive into that, I just want to kind of explain to you that as a structural biologist, um, this particular parasite is very challenging to work on, um, particularly for us, because the genome is so um, aggregation prone. So there's a lot of you know, highly charged, low, ex uh, low complexity regions that are littered throughout the entire proteome. And that makes these proteins extremely difficult um, to express in recombinant systems, which is what we traditionally as structural biologists like to do, right? So it's very easy to make E. coli or yeast kind of grow up a ton of your proteins so that you can use it for structural studies. But in this case, most of the proteins that we're interested in um, don't express well in recombinant systems. And so what we've had to do um, in order to do structural biology on this, on this um, really fascinating parasite is find ways around this problem. And so in my lab, how we've, um, during my PhD and then now in my lab, how we've chosen to get around this problem is basically by going after structures directly from, like purified, enriched from the actual parasites themselves. And this is made possible by this technique called cryo-electron microscopy. So um, now there's been, it's been long enough since the resolution revolution, I'm sure lots of you are aware that um, the cryo-EM has kind of really broken open um, the, the doors on allowing the structural uh, characterization of proteins that were previously really not possible unless you could get tons and tons of that protein purified, usually from recombinant systems. <clears throat> so just to kind of tell you a little bit about the, the, the two techniques that we use. So it comes in two flavors. Um, and the, the goal of both of these techniques, cryo-electron microscopy, single particle cryo-electron microscopy, and cryo-electron tomography, is basically, at the end of the day, to get a three-dimensional reconstruction at high resolution of the, your protein complex of interest. And our goal in doing that is basically, we need to get different views of your complex from many, many different angles so that we can come, come up with a 3D shape, right? And so there's two basic ways to do that. So the first way is called single particle cryo-electron microscopy, where we purify our protein out of cells. We um, take lots of cells, we purify our protein out, um, we freeze those on a grid, and then we um, put it in the microscope. And you take lots and lots of images and you get millions of particles of, of your protein that are randomly suspended in the ice. And you get a lot of your different views, all represented from your particles being in different orientations in your micrographs. And so then you can classify those and then uh, use those to kind of get these um, different views or 2D class averages. And those you can use to back protect to get your, um, to back calculate to your 3D volume that gave rise to those um, 2D projections. So that's um, kind of the work that you're probably more familiar with. There's been a lot of really cool structures that have come out very recently, sp um, specifically from malaria uh, parasites um, using this technique. So there's this beautiful MSP1 structure that was done recombinantly by Misha Kushishev. Um, this, obviously, you guys are probably aware of the PFCRT structure, also done recombinantly um, from the lab of David Fiddick, our ROPH complex uh, structure, as well as the um, RH5 Psi RPA Ripper complex from Alan Kalman's group down in Australia. And then, of course, there's my personal favorite, PTEX. So the thing, obviously, these structures are super cool. We learn a lot from them. But the thing that's really frustrating about them is that we don't get a picture like this, right? So we don't get the cellular context. We get just the view of the, the protein by itself. And you don't get any of that cellular context that tells you all of the cool things about what that protein is doing, right? So um, I think kind of the new, this new angle in my lab is kind of born out of the frustration of going and giving talks about PTEX and having people ask me questions about like, how, how are proteins refolded once they exit the other side? Or how does PTEX recognize which proteins um, it should be unfolding? And I had to answer all of those questions with, 
I don't know, because unfortunately, we don't have the cellular context to tell us the answers to those questions. And so that's kind of really what motivated um, this new area, or kind of new uh, area of research in our lab, um, now that I started my own lab, which is um, to do cellular tomography. So this is um, how tomography works, cryo electron tomography. Again, you're trying to get different uh, views of your object. But in this case, instead of having thousands or millions of uh, different copies of, your, of the same object with different views in a static image, what we're doing is we're taking a single object and we're tilting it. So we, we take an image at zero tilt, we, we tilt three degrees, take another, um, another image. And so we get images of the same object from many, many, many different angles. And that's how you get all of your different views. And you're able to reconstruct those into um, kind of a 3D volume that contains that particle, right? And so what does this look like um, when we actually move into cells and not cartoons? So this is what we're doing in our lab now um, to kind of get at some of these questions is basically we're taking, uh, we're directly taking parasite infected red blood cells. Uh, we're not breaking them open anymore. So we preserve that side of their context. We freeze them on the electron microscopy grid. And then we use a special um, a microscope called a focus ion beam scanning electron microscope to ablate um, the cell mass above and below, the cell material above and below our area of interest. So this is, um, you're basically blasting away or vaporizing your material kind of one atom at a time. And so there are no cutting artifacts, so it's perfectly pristine. And because you've um, kind of vitrified, directly frozen the parasite, there's no fixation artifacts, no dehydration artifacts from fixing. So it's really as close to native as you can get. We've take them out of the incubator, we walk across the hallway and we directly freeze them. And so um, we basically thin down to this very thin section called, uh, called the lamella, which is about 200 nanometers in thickness. And from there, then we take it out of this microscope and we go across, walk across the hallway and we're able to put it into the transmission electron microscope and take tilt series. So what that actually looks like, so here we have, um, um, we usually will grow up, we'll endogenously tag if we want to, um, if we need a fluorescence tag, and then we grow synchronized culture, isolate those parasites, and then we freeze them um, on this manual plunger at the bench in our lab. So this is what our manual plunger looks like. So here you can see that's the EM grid. The Sharpie's kind of just there for scale. Um, and this here is the liquid ethane that we use to kind of plunge freeze to, to vitrify our cells so quickly that you don't have time to form crystalline ice, which would damage all of the cells, all the membranes, right? So we are putting it into the ethane so that it freezes so quickly that the parasite, the ice crystals don't uh, form and they don't damage your cell. And so the liquid ethane is cooled down by liquid nitrogen, right? And so what we do, uh, so David in our lab has just applied uh, kind of paras harvested parasites to the grid and now he's um, attaching the tweezers to the manual plunger and then he's gonna take a piece of blotting paper and wick away the vast majority of the sample, leaving a very thin layer of cells, which then if the video plays, he will then plunge down into the liquidy thing. So from this moment forward, that, that grid never leaves liquid nitrogen ever again until we are done imaging it and we throw it out. So it has to be stay under liquid nitrogen at all times from here on forward. So what we do at this point is we pick it up, uh, we, put the, we put the grid in a box inside liquid nitrogen, we put it into doer, get on the subway, and uh, go down to the, the microscope. And so here, this is the, the special microscope that I was talking about, the focus ion beam scanning electron microscope. So this is what it looks like. This is my students, Mezzi and Jing, uh, they're cooling down the microscope and loading the sample into the scope. And so once you get inside, this is what the scope looks like. So this here is the electron, um, the electron beam, and this here is the ion beam. And so we're going to basically be imaging using the scanning electron beam from uh, the top, so perpendicular to the surface of the grid. And then the ion beam comes in very, very close to parallel to the surface of the grid. And that's what we're going to be using to ablate our material. So once you get inside, this is what it looks like. So this is um, kind of the top view here. Over here is uh, from the, uh, the electron beam, and this is kind of the view from the ion beam, which is um, very close to parallel to the grid. And it's really nice that we can image with the ion beam at the same time as we're using the ion beam to ablate material, which is cool. So you can see here, we have really nice um, kind of layer of infected cells here. And we've selected a couple of cells that we're interested in here in the middle. If you, this is not the highest resolution image, but if you zoom in a little bit, you can sometimes actually see they look like, a, like an egg, basically, like a fried egg. So you can see the red blood cell around it, and you can see a tiny little bump in the middle that's the parasite. And so we're aiming basically for these cells right here. So we've got these landmarks to kind of help remind us at the lower angle where we're going. And so then what we do is basically set our boxes, and we use that ion beam to mill. And we get thinner and thinner and thinner. And by this point, um, it's the end of the day, we've been here for hours, and we are literally sitting at the edges of our seats because you're down to the point where it's under 200 nanometers and you're desperately hoping that it doesn't break. 
right? So if you manage to survive all of that, then your lamella survives, and not all of them do. You've got this very, very hair thin kind of layer here. It's 150 nanometers. This is what it looks like from the top. So you can look, see that it's so thin that all of the contrast has disappeared and you can almost see through it. And so then what we do at that point is we take it out of that microscope, still under liquid nitrogen, and we put it into a uh, doer and walk it across the hallway and then we put it into our transmission electron microscope. And when you put it in, this is what you see. So you can see here, this gorgeous lamella, you have um, a bunch of uh, red blood cells here. You can see clearly these are the uninfected red blood cells, so they're completely flat. It's just hemoglobin. There's nothing going on there. And then if you zoom in here, you can see these gorgeous digestive vacuoles. Um, and if you zoom in further, you can actually see all of this beautiful detail of the parasite living inside this red blood cell. So here, this is the uninfected red blood cell here with the red cell membrane. And here, this tiny little divot right here, you can see that's a knob. So it's, this is the first time we ever saw this. It's super cool. We must um, probably, were, the strain that we're using is not super knobby because I was kind of expected to see knobs everywhere, but we don't actually see that many. Um, we don't catch them that often, but this, this one is really kind of one of our favorites because, of, because we managed to catch this. So if you look closely here, um, this is the digestive vacuole. So you can see there's a beautiful digestive vacuole here, here the human zoan crystals. We seem to have caught a vesicle inside the digestive vacuole, which is cool. Um, so perhaps maybe from a vesicle fusing in because there's it's double membrane coming with the cytostome. And then when you get inside, I assume one membrane fuses with the membrane of the digestive vacuole, but the other one stays intact and must get broken down somehow. So here um, next to it, you can't see super well, but this has multiple layers. That's an apicoplast. So it's kind of pushed up against the digestive vacuole. And here, if you look really, really closely, um, there's two very faint lines running next to each other here. That's the parasitophorus vacuole and the, uh, the plasma membrane of the parasite. And all of this stippling that you see, very bright, uh, very light stippling, that's all um, individual protein complexes inside the cell intact as it was when we froze the cell, which the first time that we saw this, we were completely blown away. Um, so as you can see here, as um, other people have mentioned, as Dan mentioned his talk, there is a lot of hemoglobin going on, which means for us, for a long time when we first started doing this, I thought we were doing something wrong because our contrast was quite poor. For this, this is, I mean, compared to other systems, our contrast is very poor and I thought maybe there's high molecular crowding and then someone mentioned, you know, you have all of that heme and there may be labeled heme around, maybe that's contributing to this like high background in your in your images. And so it turns out that it's true. We are getting down to the correct thinness. You should have better contrast, but I think that the background scattering from all of that iron is really kind of contributing to high noise in our, in our images, which is unfortunate, but um, we deal with it. So this um, is already super cool. I mean, we, when we're at the microscope, we really just pour over, pour over the lamella, but um, the goal here is obviously to get to high resolution. And so what we do is we zoom in even further. So this is kind of like the field of view for one tilt series. So we're taking this at one angstrom per, or 1.7 angstrom per pixel. Um, and so we zoom in here to a really, really high magnification. And this is where we're gonna take our tilt series, right? So we go in and we tilt from minus 60 to plus 60. And then when you reconstruct that into a 3D volume, so this is, for those of you who do confocal, this is like going through the Z stacks, right? The Z slices in your Z stacks. So this is basically going through the Z slices of this reconstructed tomogram. So this is a 3D volume um, at that place where we took the tilt series. And so now you can see with much better resolution or much higher detail that those, uh, those red cell membranes, the knob here, the vacuolar and uh, parasite plasma membrane, as well as all of these uh, protein complexes. So then we do a lot of filtering and deconvolving to um, improve the contrast um, of our images further. And then we can use a neural network. We can train a neural network to recognize or segment out all of the cellular features, all of the ultrastructural features in the cell, as well as these protein complexes. And that allows us to get a nice three-dimensional colored reconstruction of the ultrastructure in, um, inside the cell. And the reason this is important is obviously because this is way easier to interpret than uh, squinting sideways at these really, really low, um, low contrast images that are all grayscale, right? So this is already pretty cool, but um, if you look in at each one of these, um, each one of these little golden potatoes is a ribosome, which is really neat. So you're looking at ribosomes literally as they exist inside the cell, they're, they're undisturbed. Um, but for us, you know, I'm, I'm a single particle person and so I'm used to seeing side chain level resolution. So these potatoes are a little bit disappointing, <laughs> right? So what we do next is we, we actually box out, we pick out every single one of these little, uh, these, these, uh, little potatoes and we do something called subtelogram averaging where we can bring them all together, we align them and we average them to boost the signal to noise ratio so that we get higher contrast, which means higher resolution. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this. So this is a 3.7 angstrom 
uh, reconstruction of the ribosome as it exists inside the cell. So this is the actual structure of these ribosomes as they exist inside the cell. And so you can see here all of the RNA helices. You can see on some of these, um, on these alpha helices, you can see the, the bumps that tell you those are, those are side chains. So you can actually see amino acids on, like amino acid um, resolution detail on these reconstructions. So then obviously once we did this once, um, we were like, okay, let's go in and do it across the life cycle stages. So we did it for every, uh, we went across and tried to do it for all of the different life cycle stages. Some of them are more challenging to work on them than others. But here we've got, um, we've managed to do a high resolution reconstruction from trophozoites. And then also here on the bottom from merozoites as well. The merozoites are more challenging because they're tiny and also there's way less ribosomes per merozoite. So you need a lot more of them. But here you can see, um, again, some really beautiful segmentation of this, this merozoite here. Um, the rope shoes are my favorite. They're really cool looking. So now that we've done that, we've gone through and basically uh, managed to get reconstructions from the different life cycle stages. The schizonts are the runs of the litter because uh, they're the hardest for us to, to work on. We haven't developed this method quite as well yet, so we don't have a lot of particles yet, but we're working on um, gathering that data. And so the cool thing that you can do after this, so it's not just a cool picture, um, what you can do after this is that you knew, right, you have the XYZ coordinates of where every single one of these um, these ribosomes were in your original uh, 3D volume. And so what you can do then is you can take your, um, you can take your, these, each of these ribosomes, the high resolution structure, and you can map it back into the original tomogram within this, within, and then you know, show it with the segmentation. And so now you can see all of those ribosomes within the cellular context, right? So you can actually really get back at the original question that we were trying to ask and the reason why we started on this crazy venture um, about two years ago. So you can see here, all of the ribosomes are mapped back. You can see you know, exactly where they are, the different ribosomes. You can see you know, some of them are interacting with the membranes. You can see where they are distributed in the cell. Um, and so this, I think, was, was kind of the culmination of quite a lot of work in the lab, but we're very, very excited about this particular movie. So having been able to do this, then the next big question that we had is, OK, well, what can we do with it? Is it possible? to actually visualize the molecular mechanism of a drug inside the cell. Because the whole point, I mean, yes, we want to be able to see structures of proteins inside the cell, but it'd be really cool if we could actually see what the molecular effects of a drug would be inside the cell, right? And so for, to do this, um, we kind of just set this challenge for ourselves and we wanted to see whether we would do this. So because um, the ribosomes are so prominent, there's so many of them in the cell, they're kind of a really easy system to work with. And so luckily, one of the top drugs in the clinic right now is actually a drug that is known to be an, uh, an inhibitor of the, the ribosome. So it's an inhibitor of elongation factor two. It's known kind of through resistance mutants, mutations um, to be binding to EEF2, but it's not known, the, the molecular mechanism is not known, right? And so basically uh, what we wanted to do is see whether we could kind of learn more about the molecular mechanism of this drug inside the cell. Because right now, um, kind of the limitations are we can see, we can learn a lot about the mechanism of a drug in vitro through biochemical or um, kind of in vitro assays, or we have um, kind of gym sustained looking at phenotypes, but this is not at high resolution, right? And so what we would like to be able to do is combine those two things and be able to see high resolution detail inside the cell. So what we did first is we went through and we did a, a kind of a time course, a 48 hour time course where we took um, kind of blood smears every four hours. Um, a little bit more frequently at the beginning. And so we went across and we were um, looking kind of at the course of what happened. So here you can see here's the control parasites going across 48 hours. You can see they develop into really beautiful schizonts here and then we invade around here. And so in the, uh, the drug treated uh, parasites, you can see that they basically stall out at early trophs and then they just persist like that for a really long time and then eventually just to become hypnotic and die. And so it looks like there's not a lot going on here. And so when we were trying to choose uh, which which things to go after, the first thing we wanted to see is, okay, first of all, can we see higher resolution? Can we see more detail than what's going on in these smears to tell us kind of ultrastructurally what's going on with this drug? And so the first thing we looked at is um, we kind of, in we selected a couple of time points. So for us, based on the paper, the Nature paper um, that described this, um, the drug is active in culture. Um, they, they see that it's inhibiting translation within the first 40 minutes. So they incubate the parasites with the drug for 40 minutes and they can see inhibition of translation. So we thought, oh, okay, one hours and three hours, probably a good way to go. If you wait too long, maybe it's, you won't see the effects anymore. And so we, this is a control parasite at three hours. This is a drug treated parasite at three hours. And you can see um, 
you can see some with some details. So I think that the organization of the cell is definitely a little bit messed up. We, the most obvious one is that the, the food vacuole seems really kind of smashed and condensed down and dehydrated a little bit. And to help us to see that better, we went in and, and collected tilt series all over, uh, basically papered this entire cell with tilt series and were able to fill in kind of much higher resolution I know that it does, it's not obvious from here, but if, you, if I were to zoom in on one of these and let it fill up the entire screen, we see much better res resolution for every single one of these tilt series. And that allowed us to do this ultrastructural segmentation. And we're working on the, the ribosomes for this now too. So you can see here the rough ER, you can see a beautiful digestive vacuole. It's nice and big and round with hemozoan crystals kind of in the middle, and a lot of nice empty space around them. This here we think is probably the mitochondria and maybe an apicoplast next to it. And so compare that with our uh, drug-treated parasite, and you can see here, this is the drug-treated parasite, and when you zoom in, um, again, with ultrastructure, you can see um, here the digestive vacuole seems to be kind of condensed down. It seems like it's maybe blubbing off and making like a second digestive vacuole. Um, and so this is kind of really cool, uh, but then the thing that we wanted to do next um, is obviously see what are the ribosomes doing kind of between these two states. And so then uh, ensued about a year and a half of building up an insanely, for us, huge data set. So this occupies, I think, a, like hundreds and hundreds of terabytes. Um, so take, just the data alone takes up like hundreds of terabytes. And so this is, we've gone through and basically collected tilt series. We've milled, you know, tens to hundreds of cells across different life cycle stages, drugged and not drugged trophozoites. Um, and then collected till series and picked particles out of them. And we ended up with about 129,000 uh, ribosomes. And that gave us a 4.2 angstrom consensus map. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice high resolution consensus map of these, of these ribosome particles. And then what we're able to do, uh, because we have the numbers, is we can go in and classify. And so we, we, put, we use a mask, so this is called focus classification, where we put a mask around just the ligands, because the core of the ribosome is the same between every single ribosome across all cells. And so what we do is this focus classification to separate all of the different ligand bound states. And so when we do that, we're able to kind of separate out and see lots of different uh, states and kind of um, rebuild kind of the translation cycle or recapitulate the translation cycle as it exists inside the cell. And so what you see here, we, we don't have all of the different um, stages of the translation cycle, but you can see we have a few key pieces of it um, going through. And then we have also this question mark class, which we're not sure. We're, we're, we think it's an incomplete classification, so we're still working on that one. And so then when you map that back into the cell, so we classify based on the ligand states as well as whether it's bound to the membrane or not, and then we map that up back into the cell, and you can see here, so we've, this one always takes a little bit of time. So he, now you can see all of that ultrastructure with your, with your ribosomes mapped back in. And so you can see here in bright red, I've, we've highlighted all of the membrane-bound ribosomes, and you can see you know, the localization of those next to the ER makes sense. Um, and then here in, in the normal kind of this orange color, we've got monosomes. And then here we've got polysomes in this weak color. And you can see really the localization of the polysome is kind of clustered around the rough ER. There's much less of them over here next to the nucleus and the digestive vacuole. And so we haven't completely finished this yet, but we're now hoping to do this obviously with the wild type or control cells as well to see if we see a change in the distribution of polysomes. Are they, you know, kind of, are there more polysomes? Are there less polysomes? Is it more or less translationally active? Is there a change in the number of membrane brown ribosomes um, and the localization of the ribosomes as well? And so we're able to go down and kind of do some statistics where we see um, kind of the difference in the distribution between all of these states between, uh, between, between different life cycle stages. So the ring parasites the ring stage ones are ex vivo, so these are crudely fractionated, very crudely fractionated, and you can see that there's a massive difference between the crudely fractionated stuff and the stuff that's in C2. So you definitely see more states in C2 than you do here. There's some, there's um, kind of much fewer states that you see um, out here in the ex vivo fraction. And so then we, you can, we were hoping for a really dramatic change, but what we see instead is kind of a, a, a very subtle change, right? And um, we do see kind of with the three hour tropes that the, the distribution is a little bit different, um, but we're digging into this a little bit further now. And to kind of um, help us with this, we're also doing some proteomic mass specs. So we're going in and looking at um, kind of just broad, broadly kind of, you know, the difference in the translation expression of um, proteins across the different life cycle, uh, sorry, across the different time points. And you can see here that in the first couple hours, there's not that much difference between the, the wild type, or sorry, the control and the drug-treated parasites, but as you move further in, so this is a 10 hour and 18 hour, um, 18 hour time point, you can see that there's um, a lot of proteins that are, that are being made in the control parasites that your um, drug-treated parasite is not making. So 
I like this figure because it shows really clearly that here, this is what a normal parasite looks like between like the change in expression between three and one hours versus and then 10 and 18 hours. And here you can see that in the first few hours um, after drug, the parasite is still managing to make some proteins, but here there's really nothing, right? So it, at some point, I think that what's happening is that the drug is just really kind of freezing everything and the parasite's just stalling out. It's not making proteins, it's not degrading proteins, it's just hanging out. And so we've done, this is very preliminary, um, but we've done some geoontology of the few proteins that are upregulated, and we see that the majority of them happen to be involved in um, vesicle mediated transport of some sort. So this is still kind of, this is literally hot off the press. Um, we're, we're like, put, put, this data is coming in as kind of as we speak. So I don't have a complete story yet, but our idea is to, um, basically to go in and um, eventually have a full story using both the mass spec as well as some polysome profiling as well as the, the molecular stuff of exactly what this drug is doing um, at the molecular level inside the cell and how it's killing these parasites. So with that, I just want to thank all of you for listening um, and then thank Hang Chun for sending me that crude fractionation of uh, ribosomes in the middle of the pandemic. It really saved me. We had nothing else to image at that time. So that was where the, the ex vivo uh, ring ribosomes came from. So with that, I'd just like to mention that we are hiring postdocs and thank you for listening. Excellent talk um, here yep. on to stage left. Jürgen. Jürgen Bosch. Um, so you showed us your yellow potatoes. So ribosomes are obviously big. What's your limit in size that you could um, detect? And uh, the real question behind that is, if you take alpha fold or any other thing of larger complexes, can you start uh, an, an AI supported classification? Yes. Yeah, that, no, that's an excellent question. So. Um, you're absolutely right that we are limited in terms of size. The ribosome is currently the thing that we're doing because it's the easiest thing to do. Um, I think other things are going to be a lot more challenging. So I would say that um, things down to maybe five, 300, 500 kilodalton are still okay. But if you down, get down smaller than that, especially membrane proteins that are like small and mostly embedded in the membrane, you're going to really have challenges. I think we're going to have to find some, some way around this really high heme background problem. Um, in answer to your question about AlphaFold, absolutely. I think that um, if the AlphaFold uh, predictions are good, you can definitely use that for template matching. People are looking into that now about um, taking kind of predicted structures and using them to create a 3D shape that you can then use as a template for picking out of, out of um, using kind of machine learning based approaches out of this to varying success. I think that in Plasmodium, unfortunately, the alpha-fold predictions aren't great. So like you sometimes have really great um, predictions if your protein is highly conserved and, and very similar to it, how it is in other organisms. But I've, I'm sure that all of you have found that when you go into alpha-fold for looking at your favorite protein, you're just as likely to get a bowl of spaghetti as you are a meaningful structure, right? So I think that um, at least for our organism, we have to approach that with a little bit of caution. Hello, uh, Ben Sumner and AH. Uh, the ethane, the liquid ethane, is that just to avoid the leaden frost effect, or is ethane otherwise special? Sorry, say that one more time. The liquid ethane. Yes. Is that just to stop the leaden frost effect when you drop it in from boiling, or is there some other special part of ethane? Right. So the reason we li use liquid ethane is because the specific heat capacity is huge. It's compared to liquid nitrogen. So if you ever, if you've, you know, you've dipped your hands in liquid nitrogen and it ev immediately vaporizes, it forms this kind of puff of gas that's much warmer around your hand because the specific heat capacity is very low. And so if you were to do that with your grid, you would have this pocket of slightly warmer air and your grid wouldn't freeze fast enough and you'd get really horrible crystalline ice everywhere. And so the, the reason for the liquid ethane is because the specific heat capacity is so high that when you plunge freeze it, there's no pocket of gas, it doesn't vaporize, um, and so your, your grid really freezes immediately. And you can, if you ever want to test this, don't. But if you want to test this, <laughs> try sticking your hand into liquid nitrogen and then try sticking your hand into liquid ethane and you'll see like, on the liquid nitrogen, you're perfectly fine. Liquid ethane, massive burns, which I personally have done. So don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, great talk, beautiful Thank work. Uh, James McGee, uh, grad student in Scott Williams' lab at Penn State. 
Um, you and I have had a few conversations about this, so you know I'm going to ask this. Um, so Plasmodium expresses two different types of ribosomes, and of course in asexual blood stage parasites, it's primarily expressing the A-type ribosome. Right. Um, when you're going through these different classifications, are there any potential like different structures of ribosomes? Because there is some sequence variation, and it's not known if the ribosome protein composition is different. So I just, we're not sure if the structure is going to be different. So this yeah. would be a great way to maybe have a hint. Yeah, for sure. So we, um, I don't think if we're at the resolution to be able to see RNA sequence, unfortunately, quite yet. Um, I'm sure if we keep building, maybe in a couple of years, we'll have enough millions of particles that we can get to that point. Um, but yeah, we don't see anything obvious so far. But I think that definitely potentially going in and looking at um, ribosomes from sporozoites or gametocytes would be really cool. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, well, I hesitate to ask this question because this may make me look like an idiot, but that has not stopped me previously. <laughs> Is there any value in looking at things that are that are fixed by this method? Because there are nice ways, you know, like by your Frischnex lab and stuff, to to get rid of heme mm -hmm. that have been done by pathologists for eons. Yeah. Right? So. so you might be able to get really high resolution by getting rid of that that heme, albeit you sacrifice. So I guess the question is, is there value in doing this for fixed cells? Because if see. there is, there's steps A, B, C, and D to get rid of things. Right. But if you never want to look at the fixed cell, then it's pointless. Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, I think that the, um, the point of this is the high resolution um, protein reconstructions and the fixing would ruin that. So... I, mean, I think for ultrastructure, yes, absolutely. Um, the fixing is much less work. You should do that. But um, I think that for the high resolution protein um, structures, you're really going to need to avoid fixing. I mean, the, the reason I sent you the sample is to looking for mitochondrial ribosomes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> in mitochondria. I don't know whether you ever could see it uh, in these, any of these. Uh, yeah, so that's exact, yes. Um, so we had a lot of free ribosomes, just like free ribosomes in, in the sample that you sent us. But unfortunately, we never actually saw anything that convinced that we were convinced was a mitochondria in that prep. Um, and the other thing I will say is that, yes, we have, we have hundreds of tomograms now, and we scout every time we see a mitochondria, we kind of really pay extra close attention to that, also extra close attention to the apicoplasts. And I would love to be able to tell you that we can get a structure that way, but unfortunately, I think I had my students go in and check um, to count, and I think that the total number of mitochondrial ribosomes we've managed to get out of all of these thousands of tomograms is 10. Wow, better yeah, than zero. they're very sparse. They're better very than rare. zero. Yeah, and, I mean because you're not even. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're not even like you. You know, our field of U and Z is so small that you're not even catching the entire mitochondria, right? You're kind of catching a slice of it, and then you have to hope that you get ribosomes in that slice. And the same thing is true for the picoplast. I think the number is maybe two. So uh, another thing <laughs> I wanted to do. So, so since the contrast is low because of hemoglobin. Yeah. Is it possible just to do saponin lysis? And you, you don't fix it. You do saponin lysis to remove the hemoglobin and yes. then, then put, it, put it into this fixation. So that's definitely a thing that we could consider. Um, we do have some problems with the freezing of parasites that are not intact. They don't, they don't pack as well. And so we get a lot of crystalline ice, unfortunately. But for regular but, transmission EM, it works very well. Yeah, so I mean, that's definitely something that's a great idea. I'm going to write it down right now and we're going to try it. I think the other thing that we would like to do is maybe organelle fractionation because then you get away from like the organelles stay intact, right? So it's still native, but like you don't have that hemoglobin. So yeah, there's, we're actively thinking of everything we possibly can to get around this problem. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.